Have you heard about the new MagnaGrip Pro Nozzle? The MagnaGrip Pro Nozzle is the easiest, most advanced nozzle ever, protecting you from the dangers of diesel exhaust fumes. With its patented flex magnet technology, the Pro Nozzle easily attaches with one hand from a standing position, can snap on from any angle, and fits flush to the apparatus, saving a ton of space. A MagnaGrip is the only exhaust removal system that offers a true 100% seal. For free grant assistance and to learn more, go to magnagrip.com. This fire engineering podcast is made possible by Tenkata Protective Fabrics. The global leader in flame-resistant fabrics, Tenkata Protective Fabrics enables millions of people worldwide to be great at what they do. Generations of industry professionals serving in the fire service, industrial, and military industries rely on Tenkata fabrics for safety, comfort, and confidence. From the harshest working conditions to the welcoming sight of home, Tenkata recognizes the people they're protecting are unique individuals whose lives extend beyond work. Supporting a world of evolving needs, Tenkata's innovations lead the way in user-centric design, technology, and sustainability around the globe. To learn more, please visit TenkataFabrics.com. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Fire Engineering Blog Talk Radio in this installment of the Professional Volunteer Fire Department, the podcast that is dedicated to our great volunteer fire service and getting all of our listeners to embrace the message that developing and displaying and maintaining a professional image and reputation is the duty and responsibility of all firefighters, paid, paid on call, volunteer, it need not matter because true professionalism is defined not by any paycheck, but by our very real examples of service and dedication and competency, courtesy and compassion. Tom Merrill here, glad to have you listening in and joining us today. And as always, thank you to Chief Bobby Halton and the great folks at Penwell and Clarion Events and of course, Fire Engineering for supporting all the great fire engineering podcasts and allowing me as well as all the other great colleagues of mine that are out there to talk about our great fire service and focus on important and very timely topics. And as always, so much going on in our fire service um, and myself personally. I, I just got back from the great state of North Dakota. Uh, the great hosts there from the North Dakota Firefighters Association, they put on an awesome conference, their 138th convention. Great to see it still going strong. Um, they welcome me. Uh, they chose my professional volunteer fire department presentation to be their keynote presentation for the conference and I was so grateful for that opportunity and again I want to thank them for that and thanks to uh, Tom Roach and Chief John Heidel and all the others for inviting me there and allowing me to meet so many really so many passionate and driven and awe-inspiring firefighters every time I go to these conferences I come away fired up they fire me up because um, you know we hear so much bad news today and I go to these conferences and walk away and just say there are really good people in this world and a lot of them are in our fire service and there's a lot of great professional volunteer fire departments out there and I witnessed it again this past weekend in North Dakota met so many sisters and brothers from across the great state and beyond and they're doing incredible things and they're just incredible people so i really appreciated that opportunity they made me an honorary member of the north dakota firefighters association that's a great honor um i was just uh, walked away just so fired up and and, and just had a, a great great weekend and next week i'm gonna be off to the uh, new york state show the new york state chiefs conference which is in syracuse new york um, I have a small, shorter one and a half hour presentation based on the professional volunteer fire department, but this one's a little shorter and I title it uh, professional development for the volunteer firefighter. And I'm going to focus on things that the individual firefighter can do to make themselves just a little bit more professional in all that they say and do. And uh, I'm looking forward to that meeting up with the uh, brothers and sisters from across New York state and Syracuse next week. And then week after that, it's off to Orlando for the National Volunteer Fire Council's training symposium, where I'll be 
presenting social fitness skills to improve community relations uh, for the volunteer firefighters. So lots going on, looking forward to hitting the road and meeting up again with so many people. And they teach me just as much as I pass on to them. So I'm always coming home with notes and things to add and new ideas for presentations. And next year, hopefully at FDIC, my book will be coming out. That's my goal anyway. That's my editor's goal from Penwell as well. Uh, they told me to start talking about it. So I'll be watching for that. The book, The Professional Volunteer Fire Department, based on my writings, based on my podcast, based on my conversations with firefighters like you. Um, really looking forward to getting that finished up and published and hopefully out by next year. And I'll keep you posted every step of the way. And for this evening, coincidentally, we're going to do a book review. And I'm excited to have an author on board with us tonight, an author who certainly has great credentials and experience and a background in our volunteer fire service and has lots to talk about. The book we're going to review is What I've Learned So Far, Leading and Managing Volunteers. I hmm, think that's timely an important topic for this show. So um, Chief John Buckman is going to join us. And as he puts on his book, he's an author. He's a grandpa. And he doesn't say grandpa. He says grandpa. We're going to talk to him about that. <laughs> he's also a photographer. So again, a very pertinent topic. It's a book directed at volunteer firefighters, volunteer fire officers, and by extension, volunteer fire departments. But the listener, you, the listener, certainly are going to be uh, taking away a lot of good things tonight. So um, if you've been listening to the podcast, you know we spent the first half of this year so far talking about recruiting and retaining volunteer members. We've had some great guests talking about what's going on in their areas, what's working and what's not working and getting their observations, learning from their experiences. So the opportunity to discuss that with tonight's author, uh, Chief Buckman, and learn from his experiences um, is going to be priceless. So for those who don't know Chief Buckman, um, he was a chief for leading volunteers for 35 years. He's been a member of the volunteer fire service. I hope I can say this chief for over 50 years now. So <laughs> this is just such a great topic to talk about tonight. And it's going to keep in line with our conversations this whole year about uh, the professional volunteer fire department and, and what we can do to recruit and retain members and get to know our members. So I'm so honored to have you on board, Chief Buckman. Um, appreciate it. 35 years as chief in Evansville, Indiana, 52-year member, I believe, of the department. That's an incredible, incredible, incredible resume. I know you're still involved. I read your resume. You're still uh, president of your board, and you've done so much more than that. So rather than me tell everyone what you've been up to, I'd like to welcome you to the show and tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, and thanks for being here. Well, Tom, thank you very much for inviting me and, and for the listeners to, to give up their time uh, to listen to me and you talk about the volunteer fire service. Uh, it's really not about me. I have been so lucky to get to meet people who opened doors for me and allowed me to get inside and help them and they helped me. And so when I look at what I've been able to accomplish, it's not about I, it is about we. Uh, we were, we, you know, when I got in, I could always rely on going back to them for a consultation, for advice. Uh, but Tom, you, you bring up a very valid point. I just, this weekend, past weekend, I spoke to the Tennessee Fire Chiefs Association. I'll be joining you in Orlando in a couple of weeks. And, uh, but here's what, as I was writing the, the, my presentation, when they called me, it's like, you know, I, I'm driving. So when I do my best uh, writing, I think is where I'm uh, talking and texting. But my first slide that I showed was the volunteer firefighter is not dead. We have so many people declaring the volunteer fire service is dead. We are transitioning to a newer model. We got to take the Benjamin Franklin model from 1736 and adapt new operating philosophies. We have to treat volunteers similarly, but not the same. When I talk about, you know, you have on a, on a, in a high school football team, you have the starters and the reserves. You treat them differently, but similarly. Mm -hmm. Because in, in, in the volunteer fire service, you have the A team player who's making 70% of your calls and 90% of your training, 
who want some privilege or want some kind of uh, bang for their buck. And you got the B player who does 20% of runs and 20% of training, and he wants the same thing. I'm sorry. The B player is not going to get the same as the A player. Now, that is different in a management philosophy because, you know, you're supposed to treat everybody the same from a discipline standpoint. And discipline is both positive and negative that you treat everybody the same. Well, I say it's not the same. It's similar. You still have to be fair, but you don't have to treat everybody exactly the same because they are all contributing at different levels. And so one of my messages is the volunteer fire service is not dead. Quit complaining about it. Change it. If something's not working, change it. If you can't get volunteers, then maybe it's time to pay some part-time people. Maybe it's time to be paid on call. You know, there's lots of different models out there. Right. So you know, right. that's, that, you know, I guess to kick this thing off, that's, uh, that's my opening comment. Well, that's awesome because, you know, you've already got my mind reeling. First off, the first thing you said about doing your thinking as you're driving, that's like me. I do my best thinking when I'm driving and I'm taking notes, re talking into my phone, or sometimes that's when I'm sleeping and I wake up at three in the morning with a ta-da moment and I'm stumbling around trying to write it down, waking my wife up. She's like, what's going on? You know, but that's, that's sometimes when my best thoughts come to me, or I'll be listening to a podcast as I'm driving a long distance and they'll say things that I want to work in to my presentations or maybe my book that I'm writing. And it's like, I got to pull over to write it down. So I don't forget. So that's one thing you said, but, but what you hit the nail on the head, you know, with, with this negative is negative, 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 the volunteer fire service is dead. It's horrible. It's falling apart. And it, it falls in line with, I've been, I said it a few times and, and, and my listeners maybe have heard it. And if someone's listening for the first time this year, I'm going to say it again. And that is this, my little saying and my spiel the volunteer fire service of the 50s and the 60s, the 70s, 80s, 90s, even early 2000s, absolutely fantastic, filled with fantastic people. They did incredible things. They built their volunteer fire department from scratch, basically working with little to no equipment and just working with little budgets. And, and they built what they had today. Absolutely fantastic times. Great people did great things. But those days are gone they're never coming back. That's not a bad thing. That doesn't mean the volunteer fire service of 2022 can't also be a great thing because we've got great people. I just saw them this weekend, as did you in Tennessee uh, last week. And we just need to sometimes open our minds up to new ideas and not be afraid to what change. And I know there's that stigma. Was it Chief Brunacini who said firefighters hate two things, right? Change in the way things are. Folks, if it's not working, change it. And you heard me talk on the show now the last couple months or a couple shows about our duty shift program. Brand new for us. A big change. Not accepted with open arms by everybody. That's, that's people being people and boards being boards. But we said it at our meeting. What do we have to lose by trying? If it doesn't work, we'll tweak it or we'll get rid of it and try something else. So Chief, you started the show off perfectly there. Awesome, awesome. When did you get into the fire service? Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got involved and what brought you to where you are today? And what got you writing books? <laughs> well, what got me into the fire service was that siren up on top of that fire station. I lived about a block away and, uh, I wanted, you know, so me and two friends started hanging around, talking to the guys, asking for permission. They didn't have an opportunity for 16 and 17 year olds whose fathers were not on the fire department. Uh -huh. So they had to change the rules to allow us to be members. And we had to get sponsors. So I had two adult firefighters who sponsored me, Jerry Compton and Don Johan, both of them former chiefs, both of them great chiefs. And so they sponsored us. Now, the reason they sponsored us was because in the refrigerator for 25 cents was beer. And we couldn't <laughs> be in the fire station without an adult there. And that is the way it was back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and even into the 80s. In many volunteer fires, they had beer. So, so that's how I got in. So I got in by breaking the rules, so to speak. And then, you know, ch or challenging the status quo. And so Jerry was a great mentor to me and Jim Feckmeister and Nick Gossman, the other two guys who we all came on together. Uh, great mentor, gave us lots of advice. He was, he was the first professional fire chief that German Township had in 1963. 
We'd been, we'd been in business for four years. The guy who was there before us or for Jerry was, is basically, it was a, you know, good old boys club. And, you know, you, you did, you did good things. You made the chief happy. You got promoted. So that's, that was my initial phase. Um, I got elected as fire chief uh, in 1977 by the old guys. It wasn't that the young guys had the majority. The old guy said, we want his, his change. I had, we had changed the rules. The rules back in the 60s and early 70s were two years and out. We had changed the rules to allow for four years. So the guy who preceded me was Lester Garrett, who is, again, a great chief, very progressive, forward thinker. He served four years, and then, you know, he, might, he served as my assistant chief after I was put up by, fire, by, by the board. In our system, the board nominates the fire chief and the assistant chief. The members vote yes or no. There are no nominations from the floor. And that's been that way since we started in 1959. So those guys who, who and it was guys who wrote that rule, they sort of understood a popularity contest. If you go out on the floor, I mean, I, and I know you, you've seen these too, Tom. I remember this one volunteer fire department they had everybody's name up on the blackboard when it came, came to the day of election. If you didn't want to run for fire chief, you went up and erased your name. Now, what <laughs> person's going to do that? Wow. Nobody, I mean, we all have egos. We're not going to, so, you know, sometimes the guy got elected with six votes because 10 other people got votes and that's the majority. Well, that's not necessarily the best person for the job. It's the most popular. Sure. And that may help them, but it's not necessarily the, the, the best way to select your fire chief. So got into that. Uh, we, we were always big about training. In 1967, uh, German Township bought the first fire truck that had rear suction. Uh, we were in the IFSTA ground cover firefighting book uh, with the old red books. And uh, that was in there. Had a folder tank, uh, a portable pump, 500 gallons per minute, Coventry Climax portable pump carried by two people. Would do 500 gallons a minute at 150 PSI. And so it was always about training. So they, Jerry encouraged us to go to training wherever we could. The department paid for most all of it, paid for the room, that sort of thing. So that's sort of my introduction. Now, writing, um, uh, Ed McCormick, who's the head of the International Society of Fire Instructors and owned FDIC at the time. I don't know how I hooked on to him or how he, how he hooked on to me, but he liked what I wrote. He, and so I got to write in the society's a monthly vo voice magazine. And then I got invited to speak at FDIC. I got to speak at FDIC when Ed owned it or the society owned it uh, basically three times in 10 years from the main stage. Only officers had been able to do that, but that was because of Ed and Ed gave me, gave me an opportunity and it was go on from there. So after that writing, uh, then, you know, it's like I helped, uh, Rewrite the third edition of the uh, Recruiting, Training, and Maintaining Volunteer Firefighters by Jack Snook and Dan Olson. Uh, helped VFIS write a couple books on risk management. Um, wrote my own book with Stephen Gower out of uh, Georgia on lessons learned from fire rescue leaders. Uh, Chief Officer Desk Reference from uh, Jones and Bartlett. And uh, wrote, wrote lots of, just writing lots of articles for fire engineering too. I mean, I was, you know, the volunteer's corner way back those times ago, Diane, who just celebrated 30 years with fire engineering yeah. today, yeah. Uh, Diane would beg people to write for the volunteers' corner. So when she didn't have somebody step step up, she called me up and said, "You got one?" I go, "Yep, it'll be there in 10 minutes." So yeah. I they I had, you know, I don't know how many articles in fire engineering. So uh, they very lucky. I was very lucky to get to know so many great people, and and many of them still around, and many of them still friends. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's funny, you, you start writing, you never know what it'll lead to, you know, same with me, and all of a sudden you realize years have gone by, you've written a ton of articles, and, you know, putting presentations together, and getting invited places, especially the great stage that is FDIC, and then you, you, you look back, you don't even know how it all came to where you are, but it happens, and, and for our listeners, you know, I know I get contacted quite a bit, I'm sure you do too, Chief, by people that want to get involved and, and put presentations together, and be invited to teach, and go about Start writing articles, uh, come up with your brand and what works for you and what you want to concentrate on and start writing articles. They're always looking for, for great new ideas and new writers out there. So, um, boom. And, all of and a sudden. If, fire, if, if fire engineering does not have space or time, 
uh, go to the state magazines. I mean, I just had an article published in uh, the FASNI magazine uh, two months ago. Yeah. I've had articles published in other state magazines that are not as fancy, not as widespread as uh, fire engineering, but to still get it out there because people are not going to hire you if they don't have some idea what your philosophy is, what your background is, what you believe in. And that's how you get it out there is you get it out there by writing publicly write publishing writings that people can read and see, oh yeah, I want to hear Tom speak. Yep. Yeah. Great advice. Great advice. I got to ask you going out of order here. So it was two years for the fire chief. Then it went to four years. How did you end up with 35 years? <laughs> well, then, then they, they changed the rules and said, you know, as long the board just keeps nominating the fire chief every two years. So every two years I was being reelected to the position and, um, uh, you know, they were very, the, the board was very nice to me for my last two years. I really wasn't a good fire chief for those last two years. I was the state fire academy director here working in, working in Indianapolis three hours from home. So I would leave on Monday and I'd come home on Friday or sometimes I wouldn't even come home for a couple of weeks, <laughs> but uh, because there was always something to do, some place to go. Um, I did yeah, the fire marshal uh, and I, we, we always compete on how many miles we did each month. So I was doing three to 4,000 miles a month on the car. And that's not driving back and forth in Annapolis every day. That is going to Annapolis, staying in Annapolis, going to Gary, going to Crown Point, going to Fort Wayne, in a meeting, talking about training, looking at crops, so on and so forth. Uh, when, when the governor um, asked me to do it, I said, do I have to be in the office every day? He goes, no, nah, you don't have to be in the office every day. I'll get, okay, that's good. But I, I wasn't. And, uh, but we had a good time. I had 15 years in that job. Uh, we didn't have a state training system before that. And so uh, I got to start that from the ground floor and, and build build the foundation. And it's still functioning today without me. How mad did you get when you were out of town and missed a work and fire? <laughs> you know, I, I, well, see, I didn't miss, if I missed a work and fire in Evansville, I made three of them in Indianapolis. Ah, okay. Because <laughs> I was fire buffing it in Indianapolis with my camera. Uh, the PIO in Indianapolis liked me, Rita, and then the photographer, Roger Birchfield, uh, he liked me and I never, you know, I got yelled at by Rita one time for being too close. <laughs> and I learned not to mess, not to mess, make the battalion chief. She's a battalion chief rank. Don't make her mad. <laughs> and I Keep say her on the good side. Keep her on the good side. I got to make a mistake one time. And uh, so lesson learned, but, but it, again, I, I'm very lucky. And, and the Indianapolis guys are very friendly to photographers. They like them. They like the pictures. You know, I, I've never used an embarrassing picture unless somebody gave me permission to use it. Right. I have some, you know, you always catch somebody making a face or doing something silly, but I've never shared those. Yeah. I'll share them with the person and you do with them what you want, but I've never published them. Because that's uh, so, classy. You know, that's the professional right. thing to do. <laughs> right? That's right. Keep, that's right. It, yeah, yep. keep it classy. So, well, let's get into the book. What I've learned so far, leading and managing volunteers. Um, it's an easy read, and I and I mean that in a really good way because it's 111 pages. It's packed full of great information, and I highly encourage uh, you listeners to to go online and get it. We'll talk about how to get it in a bit, but great lessons learned, you know, lots of great advice, all based on your great career in the volunteer fire service. And I was talking before the show here, telling the chief that it's also a great book just to keep by your end table or your nightstand or for me by my favorite lounger you, you pick it up you can leaf through it um mine's on my outside patio i pick it up while maybe i'm enjoying my favorite beverage or two and uh you know you read it a few pages at a time keep a highlighter handy and digest the information so uh what what got you writing this book out of you know you've written a lot you've contributed to a lot and now you came out with this this latest book what was there something that just was the timing just perfect to do it or what, what got you doing that? Yes. Time, timing is perfect. I have been, <clears throat> I've been writing uh, numerous reports over the last several months or the last couple of years since I retired, I rewrote the yellow room report, the lavender report from the volunteer and combination officer section. We're now rewriting the training uh, white paper. The national volunteer fire council has that's now being edited. Uh, and I, I just, and it's like when I got the lavender ribbon report done, it was like a weight off my shoulders. Like, oh my God, you got all this stuff floating around in your brain. It's running. You got to slow it down. Well, slow it down by putting it on paper. And I had notes. My dad taught me about taking notes. And I have, you know, now I have electronic notes. 
I have paper notes going back to the 70s and the 80s. And I read a lot of books, not just fire service books. So it, it was a perfect storm. It just yeah. all came together with the first book. Uh, you know, and then and, and the second book was you basically fell out again of like, well, you have more stuff. This one can focus here. And I'm going to get another one. I got one more in my head on uh, limited staffing, fire, 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 uh, firefighting with limited staffing. Uh, very little written about that. Uh, you know, John Salk and I just had a conversation about fire suppression operations with six people. Mm. I know that's probably not quite in compliance with two in, two out. But the question is, can you do it with six people? Mm -hmm. Yes, you can. But, and that's a big but, all three letters capitalized, you have to be more cautious. You have to be more conservative. You can't send them into a basement fire with only six people, in my opinion. You can't send them to a second floor fire without more, with more, without more than six people, in my opinion. First floor fires, I think pump operator, incident commander, two on an initial hose line, two on a backup hose line who also maybe do a little ventilation. The vast majority of interior first floor fires you can do with six people. There is risk involved. So that, you know, that that's probably where I'm going to go. That's next awesome. Is, that's awesome. Yes, we can. Yeah. And it's also, you know, when you talk six people, it, it's probably realistic in many areas too, especially daytime, right? Volunteer fire department in the day until that other help gets there. You might only have that handful of people. So sounds like a great topic. Look forward to that. And I, and I know what you mean about the weight off your shoulders, because um, as I finish writing my book, um, for the last couple of years, I've been working on it. It's a weight. And I don't mean that in a bad way at all, but it's just, it's always, when you think you have downtime, you, you're thinking, oh no, I should be working on the book and getting some, a chapter done or some photos done, things like that. So, and, and it's funny because as much pressure as that is, I'm already thinking of a second book in my mind as well, uh, related to the volunteer fire service. So hopefully I can have some success with the first one and move on to a second one, but all in due time, all in due time. So, um, so this book, um, you, you mentioned that you hope that uh, the book can help the reader manage and lead volunteers. In fact, it, it's right in the title, of course, isn't it? Leading and managing volunteers. But you point out that they're two different things. I was wondering if you could tell us what you mean by that. Well, manage, management is the paperwork, so to speak. And leading, and I don't say leadership, because leading, leadership is, a, is not a verb. Leading is a verb. It is an action word. So leading is your job to inspire. It's to create that vision, to create that opportunity that people want to follow you. And you do that. I know there are some people that say you should be behind the group, pushing the group. I believe you lead by pulling the group along with you. You start out with 20 and you might only have 12 by the time you're done because people will drop off. Yeah. I don't care who you are. So I, my point is that the leader of the department does leading by having that rope out there and saying, this is my idea. This is what I think it will do for us. What do you think? And get their opinion, maybe make some changes based upon their input and then say, hold on to the rope. Let's go. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that is where I see fire chiefs. I'm not just volunteer fire chiefs. Uh, we are afraid to upset the status quo. We like the way things are and i believe that's not true i believe we have to change you, you mentioned earlier about uh, the changes in the 60s 70s and 80s our society has changed our communities have changed our culture has changed some for the good and some for not so good but if we're not keeping up with our community what who are we serving it's our customers i think volunteer fire chiefs should tell the public what our limitations are. Yeah, be upfront and honest we, about that. Right. We do not provide hazmat technician level service. If we have a gasoline tanker turnover on in our district, we're going to be calling the outside department to come help us. If we have a chemical leak, you know, we, and we have some factories, we could have that. If we have a chemical leak, again, we're not doing that service. We don't do tech rescue. We don't do high angle rescue, uh, those kind of things. Tell the public your limitations. Because they believe, the public believes that every fire department is just like Chicago Fire. Mm -hmm. Right. The good and the bad of Chicago mm -hmm. Fire. Uh, you know, I, I watched that the first time, went, 
eh, this is not going to be a big fan of that because, you know, first first session or first uh, uh, episode was sex, drugs, and alcohol in the fire station. Like, really? Yeah. That's not reality. There is, it is reality in some places, but that's not the vast majority. And so we gave the public the perception, well, that's what firefighters do. Drugs, sex, and alcohol in the fire station. No, 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 we don't. Yeah. The vast, vast majority of us do not. So, you know, that I think that's the kind of stuff that, that we have got to look at. Our, our writings have got to motivate you. I tell people, if I don't make you mad with what I write, then I'm not really doing a good job because I need to motivate you to do something. That's how, when we go back and look at my fire engineering articles, we, if you look at them and say, go back to my guys who were on my fire department, they go, we know when we know when we ticked him off that day <laughs> and it ends up being an article. Yeah. Right. It could be the best therapy there is. <laughs> right. They, you know, they, they, they did something dumb and stupid. It's like, I'm going to write about it. And here it was six, eight months later, they're going, we know when we did that. Yep. Glad you do boys. Now, did you learn a lesson? Yep. So that, again, that's the point. So I, I firmly believe that we have got to challenge the status quo department wide and individually wide and in, individually. Oh, that's yeah, definitely challenge the status quo. And also I, I like what you said too, about, you know, inspiring people to, to get them to come along, you know, people want to follow a good leader and um, it doesn't come automatically with the promotion or the election or when you pin that collar and say, beyond, you got to learn how to do that. You got to understand what goes into that and, and getting people to tag along with you. It just doesn't happen automatically. And some people, well, think, I think, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, chief. Well, and then this is probably the most difficult part of being a leader today be positive throw the negativity out people don't want to come to the fire station and hear people gripe and complain there there are times to have those sessions but call it a gripe session but don't have people come to the fire station and all they ever get is oh we're so terrible we're so bad we don't have any money we can't do training we we can't do this you know blah 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 the leader has to set the positivity you know, I, I, I listened to a guy named Dennis Waitman, who wrote the book Psychology of Winning. It's an audio book, one of my first audio books. His new book, second, or the, uh, uh, the new psychology one is just out. Dennis has always been Mr. Positivity in all the things that he has done. He sold over 2 million books. I got to hire him to come to the International Fire Rescue International to speak. So I got to hang out with my mentor my role model my hero and uh, we became friendly and dennis is mr positive i have never heard him say a negative thing but dennis had two bouts of cancer and a heart uh, stint put in all at the same time wow and tom and and the readers listening dennis waitley went into a skilled nursing facility at a, at a nursing home and six months later he was at, let out because he had recovered. But this is what they told him when they wheeled him in on the cot. They said, put him in bed, said, here's your remote control. There's your TV. That's what you do all day. He goes, no, I don't. Yes, that's what you do all day. Lay in this bed and watch TV. He goes, no, I don't. I get up. I get breakfast. I'll take a shower. I'll come back down here and I'll work on my computer. He, he recovered from all those uh, illnesses or uh, injuries. He was 83 years old. He is now 87, planning to go to Beijing, China next year. Ah, oh, wow. This, and so my point is, as bad as he had it, I mean, cancer twice, heart stent, um, and I was, I, he might, he may, he may get unhappy. He now has, he told me about six weeks ago, he now has lung cancer. And, you know, at 87, I'm praying for him. I, you know, I know he's fighting it positively. His birthday was on June 4th. And so he's 88 now. But wow, I, I firmly believe that, that your attitude, your positive attitude impacts your long-term long yeah. survivability. And by that, I mean health-wise. Yeah. And so going back to what you do as a leader and what I hope I've shared in some of the things in my book is you got to be positive. You can frame it negative, but I bet you if you think about it for a minute, 
you can frame it in a positive way. And I, I could have done that with the Tennessee Fire Chiefs. They went, yep, you guys got to just save for grant, go out and recruit people because your recruitment program sucks. No, it doesn't. They recruited 854 volunteer firefighters in the last safer grant in in one state eight and they're, they're there for a year it's not that they they recruited them yesterday and they're, they're now who knows where they are now no they track that many for a year so 854 or will have stayed a year now they've stayed a little longer than that that's awesome and so yeah. but but i could have framed that in a negative way and i i just firmly believe that every leader and, and as even even at home with your spouse and i have never claim to be the greatest husband in the world but fight to be positive with each other you know i tell young people after three to five years go see a marriage counselor they go why i said because she'll hate your guts and you'll hate hers oh no no we'll still be in love i go listen to me young man after three years she's gonna go you never put the toilet seat up or back down and you're gonna go you never do the dishes right (laughs) and that's what you're fighting over and that thing that that little little cut now gets infected and you keep talking. That's all you do is fight negatively. And Leslie, my wife would tell you, the reason we're still married, we went to a marriage counselor and within three minutes, this is what he told me. Don't try to change her. You might not like what she changes into. And it's like, oh my God, he is so right. I didn't marry her to, be, to make her what I wanted. I married her for who she was. And so- Positivity, I think, is a key part about being a leader in today's right. environment. Yeah, the power of positivity, no doubt. And and I always like to say, you know, people go to the firehouse in a lot of cases, they want it to be their great escape. That's what I call it, the great escape from whatever, you know, you're dealing with at work. You know, we all have the pressure of the on-demand, you know, the job, the demands of the job, your paycheck earning job, or even demands at home. I know last night I went to our company meeting and before I went to the company meeting, I'm home looking I'm getting a new roof on my house and it's like, ah, trying to compare estimates. I want to escape that for a couple hours, go to the firehouse, go to the meeting, hang out with the sisters and brothers, enjoy the camaraderie. I don't want to go there and get brought down and be in a negative filled environment. So you're so, so right. The power of positivity and let your firehouse be the great escape, a place people want to be at and let them escape for a short time, whatever they're dealing with in the outside world. Um, and, and yeah, positivity is huge. And, you know, it is a it is a different world though for the volunteer fire service today. You're right. I mean, the demands on people, the types of people joining, the call volume increasing, the average age going up in pretty much every firehouse. There's so many variables affecting the volunteer fire service today. Um, you know, and, and it used to be people heard the rooftop siren and oh, I want to do that. Like maybe we ought to bring the rooftop siren back in a lot of places. Maybe that is a good recruitment tool. <laughs> but what what do you think motivates people to join the volunteer fire service today? I know you talk a little bit about that in the book. Like uh, why do people volunteer today? Well, I, I would say that this is the number one reason I think they volunteer. They were asked. Uh-huh. Somebody said, would you like to join the volunteer fire department? And then you as the current member have your elevator speech ready it's about a 60 to 90 second elevator speech on why, Tom, you should join the fire department. We have fun. We get to do this. We get to save lives. You'll make a difference in your community, uh, so on and so forth. Having your elevator speech ready to sell that person. So that that is the, the first thing is that you got to ask people. And you can't just ask them one time a year because in selling photographs, what I've learned is it's an impulse kind of thing. And joining the volunteer fire department is like an impulse kind of thing also. But when they look at pictures, look at pictures, look through pictures, they don't buy them the first time. But you come back the second time, they're buying a few more. And you come back the third time, they're buying a few more. If you only showed up one time to sell pictures, you might only sold 10. Now you've sold 30. And mm-hmm. it's the same thing here with that volunteer fire, that, that potential volunteer who says, yeah, I see your big red fire trucks. It looks pretty cool. I can't do that. Well, yes, you can. We have people that are older than you, younger than you, bigger than you, small. We have all kinds of people. There is a job for you. It may not always be on the nozzle going inside a burning building. It could be operating a pump. It can be doing uh, tactical work outside, support it. But everybody can be a volunteer fire. And so you have to, so that's the the first thing is ask questions. Mm -hmm. I think after, after you get them, in the door, so to speak, uh, they look at it 
as if, if they're having fun, they're looking at it as has as an opportunity to serve. Most people want to make a difference. And that's what you that's what we're doing. And, you know, even though grandma falling out of bed at three o'clock in the morning is a royal pain in a volunteer firefighter's butt. First of all, she is somebody's mother. And she needs your help. And that's what we're in. We're in a people helping business. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about servant leadership, that's what we're doing. We are serving as a community leader to help our people in whatever it is that they need help in. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's two reasons. Selfless service for sure. So what are these volunteers looking for the organ in the organization when they join? What motivates them? You know, what do they expect when they come through the door? I know you spent a little time talking about that too, because there's certain expectations they have of the department they're coming into. Well, you, you use the word expectations. And, and I would tell you that when I talk to young people, they want to know what the department or the officer wants from them, specifically firefighter one within a year, uh, hazmat well, operations level within a year, whatever, you know, whatever it is, we want you to make 49% of the, more than 50% of the run. They need expectations and they want to be held accountable. Don't get in their way because they're, they are smarter than we were at their age. They're more worldly because of that little thing they have in their hand called a, a phone mm -hmm. or the, you know, the, the, the computer. And so they, they can look things up much easier than we could back in our day. I mean, we were mm -hmm. sitting around talking about some things last night with some other people, my wife, and, and it's like we asked a question about when Ronald Reagan was elected president. Well, in the old days, we had to go to the library and find it out. Well, just punch hey, it in your phones like, oh yeah, here it is. So they have oh, more gosh. information. Theory just came on when I said that. <laughs> the younger people are looking for a future. I have, I love talking to young people because I want to know what they want. And I'll use this one uh, general, young man named Nolan Forsley. He's a full-time college student at Vincent University, 50 miles away from Evansville. So he drives up and back. He works two part-time jobs. He's also a volunteer firefighter. I said, Nolan, why do you work so much? And he said, I have goals. I want a house. I want a new truck. I want a barn. I want to get married. I want to have kids. And I thought, wow, wow. this kid's not lazy. He has goals. But now what I just listed off was all personal goals. He didn't say anything about wanting to be a volunteer firefighter or a career firefighter. And what that tells me is we're on the list, but we're not at the top of the list. And that is one of the things for you and I, when we joined the volunteer fire department, it was like number two on the list, or in some cases, number one above faith, family, friends, finance, and fire department. And that really wasn't healthy even back in our day that we made the fire department a higher priority than we did our family. And so when you look at the, the young people, and I, I can, you know, I, I had one, uh, Logan Miller, who said, I'm going to do this. You see, he invited me over to his house around Christmas where they had a little breakfast with a, a group of firefighters. And he said, you've been in my house. He said, but I, I'm getting married. And he said, I'm going to tear it, tear it down and build a bigger house. I said, okay, cool. And I'm going to be on the fire department for 20 years. I said, thank you, Logan. <laughs> That's the first guy, first person who told me I don't be on the fire department for 20 years. I don't really know why he doesn't want to join the career fire service, but he's a mechanic. He's got a good job. He's making almost six figures uh, being a mechanic, not in a building. He does work in the coal mines, so he's got plenty of work, but he had goals as well. And the fire department wasn't in the top two, but we're probably in the top four. So each one of these, the younger people, they have desires. You have to figure out what their desires are and how you can make sure the fire department is helping them with their desires. You know, and it makes our job as a leader much more difficult, much, you know, different strokes for different folks is a motivational uh, statement. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You right. can't motivate all these young people the same way. No. You have to learn how they are motivated, what makes them tick, what they like, what they don't like. And that makes your job as a leader much more difficult. Yeah, we're finding that they like all different things today, too. Like, I know they they really like the use of technology, uh, the uh, convenient scheduling. You know, the, the old days of scheduling, you know, just dropping what you're doing to go to calls. Maybe it worked when you worked in the corner hardware store and they let you go out. But it's just a different world today. 
And um, you really got to get to know your people. That is such an important job. And it's not just a chief's job. It's not just a president's job. It's pretty much anybody's job. When you see a new member coming through the door, get talking to them and find out what makes them tick. And, and then if you are in that leadership position, find out what the department can do to help them achieve their goals. It's called, it's called manipulation, which is sometimes, you know, that carries a negative connotation to it. But I, I say it's very, it's a positive statement. Because you're going to tell me what you want, so I'm going to manipulate the the issue or the, the job I need worked on, and I'm going to manipulate you to help me get that accomplished. And a part of that is going to be I'm going to create that energy, positive energy that you can do it. Yeah, I know you can do it. I will support you, but it's going to have your name on it when you're done with it, and I hope you'll be proud of it. Yeah, and you know you mentioned something else there too about putting family first and the mistake we make often is putting the fire department first and it reminds me just this uh, past memorial day um it, it's one of my regrets and i'm i'm sure it's shared by so many especially if they've gone through the officer ranks and, and became a chief officer or president you know something that takes a lot of time but so on memorial day we had a nice family dinner uh, my four beautiful daughters were at the table along with my wife and we're sitting there talking and they were reminiscing about some of their childhood memories with their mother. You know, they're all adults now. So it was fun. It was fun to hear their recollections from their childhood. Um, you know, you, as a parent, you always wonder, did you give them a good upbringing? What, what are their memories like of their childhood? Are they good? Are they bad or what? So anyway, it was fun to hear them talking about their mom and, and joke about some of the mom things that she did, whether it was her dinner or certain things she said, you know, typical family stuff. So then I asked sure. him, Hey, what, what were your recollections of your father from your childhood? And they all said at the exact same time, Oh, dad, you were always at the firehouse. <laughs> now they said that with love. They really did. They weren't mad or anything like that. And actually sometimes they tell me how much they miss because they would go up there quite a bit with me and they miss some of the activities they were involved with, but it really reaffirmed. And I was going to, talk about it later but it was just perfect because you just mentioned it what you were saying you know be careful and, and make sure you're putting your family where they belong make sure they're first right that's so important well I, and I said it earlier but it's the five f's faith family friends finance fire department keep those and but number five will become number one once in a while and number two will become number five once in a while you will balance if you balance all five, the five F's, you'll have a much happier and a better life. Yeah. Yeah. Something to remember for sure. And uh, I guess it's some mentoring advice we can pass on to people coming through. And at the same time, remind, because people are always judging, firefighter, remind the judges when they maybe don't see a firefighter and they start maybe talking ill about them. Hey, Maybe they're putting their family first or working that second job to afford the new roof going on the house or whatever it is. Or as Candace McDonald always says, Dr. Candace McDonald, one of my favorite, you know, speaker when it comes to recruiting and retaining people. And she always, why should we be mad or penalize our firefighters if they choose to go to their son or daughter's school recital or baseball game or something? Right? We're penal sometimes we're yelling and getting mad about it. And, you know, they're just putting their family first. Uh, yeah, Tom, I, I can re relate to that story or relate a story to that real easy is that I was at, a, at Carthage, Indiana. They, they know I'm going to talk about them. Uh, so I, I'll say it. So it was an all day live burn training session for 24 people. We're going to do lots of live burns in their training facility. And this one young man came up at about 10 o'clock in front of everybody and said, I'm going to church. I'll be back after church. That was awesome. That took a lot of guts to do. And you know what? Nobody harassed him. Nobody teased him when he yeah. came back. They allowed him right back in. That's different. In the old days, we would harass that guy to death. What do you mean you're going to church? Don't we're more important than going to church? No. In that young man's mind, going to church was more important than the fire department. And so that's, that's again, that's that balance, managing that balance. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you, we talked a little bit about what today's volunteers are looking for from their department. What, what, uh, what are the leaders want? What do today's leaders want from their volunteers? Well, it's, we, we want to do the same thing that we wanted years ago. And they will deliver it to us, but it'll be delivered in a different way. Mm -hmm. They have the commitment, but you mentioned it a little earlier. 
duty shift. You just barely, barely mentioned it and moved on. Right. I really, I firmly believe that they want duty shifts. They prefer to say, I'll be on duty from Tuesday on Tuesday night from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. or 6 p.m. 6 a.m. And then Thursday, you know, so on and so forth. I'll do those three shifts of, of um, a week, a month. Yeah, a week. And that's, and, and when I look at the type of runs the vast majority of us make, we can probably do that. The vast majority of the smaller volunteer fire department, all volunteer, no paid on call, no compensation. You could probably get by with three people on duty a night. But we still, I, I, you know, I know and you know, uh, you still set off pages for 45 people when grandma fell and can't get up and you only need three people to go. Right. Well, then there was 42 people going, they don't need me. They don't need me. It's the cry wolf syndrome. So there's one thing that I think that with the, the department has to come up with is the way to reduce that call that they are not needed for. And it, I know it's a technology thing. Uh, you work at a dispatch center. My wife runs a dispatch center. Uh, it, it's all about training and, and, and developing the software to, to put people in service and out of service, just like they mark fire trucks in and out of service. And, um, but what, what we really want is commitment. We, the, the current, we want commitment just, just the same as we wanted to commit in the old days, but the commitment is going to be different. Uh, it's, we're not going to be on the top of the priority list all the time, but you're going to have to foster that. You're going to have to cultivate that. As the leader, you're going to have to encourage them. You got to ha hand them the rope and pull them along because they got other things to do. Mm -hmm. You know, again, one of my uh, volunteer of the year last year here at German Township, Made, made he, it was just an off the wall comment. We're talking. He goes, Yeah, I'm coaching baseball this spring. And I thought, Wow, you work a 24 hour shift. You come up here and work on your days off sometimes. And now you're going to coach a, a summer a spring baseball team. So, that, where's the fire pump come from a volunteer standpoint? Uh, we're going to miss two nights a week because he's going to be at the baseball thing. And I don't expect him to, if it's a house fire, he's leaving. Yeah, but if it's a basic medical run, car fire on the highway, again, five people is all you need. You don't need all twelve members to respond. So that I think that's the part we have to learn what their commitment is, and that will take some negotiation. I'm not saying that the fire department bends over backwards and makes accommodation for everybody, but we're going to have to treat people similarly but differently. Right, right. And then be understanding, you know, and, and you, you also put so, you know, so, so true in the book, what leaders uh, want other volunteers and it's an appropriate attitude. So we talk about the leader having the appropriate attitude. So if we're reflecting positivity, hopefully that spills over to our members too, because then they'll have a positive attitude when they're out delivering service to the public, right? If they're miserable at the firehouse, they're going to be miserable out in the public. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. And I like too how you put, you know, um, you've been in the fire service over 50 years and you had a section where you say what I've learned so far. And I love that because we never stop learning. You know, we should never anyway stop learning. And so you're here, you are a 35 year chief, 50 years in the fire service, tons of experience. And you write in the book, anyone who stops learning is old, no matter what their age. So what are some of the highlights that you like to point out in the book and the book is jam full of information for the listeners. You got to go out and get a copy of the book and we're going to talk about that, but what are some of the things you've learned? You know, never stop learning. What are some of the highlights of what you've learned about our great volunteer fire service? Well, overall, we are successful. We, we are very successful in the services that we provide. Yes. Just like Walmart has challenges. Your fire department has challenges. We're not all, we're not operating on the A level every minute of every day. That's part of the challenge for the volunteer fire service is the challenge of consistency. If you only got two people available at 10 a.m., you might have 12 people available at 10 p.m. You provide a different level of service. So when you look at that, I look at that, that's our biggest challenge is how do we get the level of service to be consistent? And so again, I believe you do that by inspiring people to do more, uh, to, to wear their pager all the time. I'm sure you wear, you put your pager on when you get out of bed in the morning. These young people don't. 
they are using Active 911 or I am responding or some app on their phone that tells them we got a call. So, you know, I think that that's that's a big thing is that how do we develop, get that consistent level of service? Yeah, for sure. And, you know, you put in there too, and I, I quoted it, I put it on my Facebook page, I gave you full credit, of course, if we hope to be viewed as professionals, we better be ready to deal with each other on a professional level. And that gets into what we were just talking about, right? Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, it's, um, well, I think you said it at the beginning, professional is not about a paycheck, professional is about performance. There are career firefighters who will not climb an aerial ladder. There are volunteer firefighters who will not climb an aerial ladder. It is what it is. Everybody won't do everything. But when you look at professional, professional starts with your attitude. You know, you're not, you, you don't pound on your chest and tell people you will give me what I want because I'm a volunteer. No, you convince them to give you what you need, not what you want to, as, a, as a professional. You talk professionally. Clean up the vulgar language. Mm. Quit talking, quit gossiping about people. But you know what? If you're gossiping about me when I'm standing, or gossiping about Tom when me and somebody else is standing there, guess what you're gossiping about? What do you guys are gossiping about when I'm gone? Mm. You're gossiping about me. It is, you know, again, if we are in the brother sisterhood, we should respect each other and not harass each other, not make fun of each other. Yeah, I'm not saying we don't do funny things and we can all laugh at each other. And you got to have that type, type of ego to allow yourself to be laughed at. Uh, but that, that's a big thing. The, the other thing is, oh, this is one of the things, sorry you had to say this, is that it's about what you wear and how you wear it. Every time you put on a shirt that has the fire department on it, you are representing the fire department. You say, oh, no, I'm, I'm just a volunteer. I'm not on duty. Wrong. Every minute of every day when you wear that shirt or that hat or that badge or whatever, you are representing the fire department and you will be expected to operate, to act professional. Um, you don't drink when you're wearing a fire department shirt because even if you don't drink alcohol, but you're sitting in a tavern and you go and make a run after the people see the fire truck come by the tavern, after you leave, they're going, oh, geez, John was drinking and now he's driving a fire truck. No, John doesn't drink. But so you got to look what, what you do and where you're doing it at. Uh, I know that you, we know they wear the T-shirt because they're proud of what they do. But I think they don't understand the consequences of wearing that shirt. It's not just a piece of cotton. It represents the entire fire department and everybody who is on that fire department. So if you want to you want to be treated like a professional, act like a professional. If you want to wear holy, I mean, the state fire marshal and I, when I was the state training academy director, when we'd be talking about going somewhere, and you know, before we go, we'd say, "Well, what are we wearing?" But during the day, we'd be wearing a suit and a tie. And he goes, "Oh, I don't know. What do you think?" I said, "Well, it's a pretty rural area, so I think blue jeans will be fine." And the first time I said that, he said. Blue jeans without holes. I do not <laughs> want holes in your blue jeans. Yes, sir. I understand. And so the same that that I watched the Indianapolis Fire Department teach their firefighters in recruit class how to dress, how to wear their uniform. So in the volunteer fire service, I think you want to improve the professional image of your department. Tell them when they can wear that T-shirt, when they can't wear that T-shirt, and what also goes with that T-shirt. Yeah. I mean, if you want to wear shorts. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I might, yeah. might get in trouble here, but you know, ladies need to wear a bra. You know, there are certain expectations whenever you're wearing this, you know, this uniform that you will be dressed like. And so that, that is a, it's a personal thing with me uh, that if you're going to wear it, be proud of it and display it properly. Yeah. You talk about that. And I, and something I talk about in my presentations all the time, and that's, you know, don't fall back on the line. I'm just a volunteer and use that as an excuse for subpar behaviors. And along with how you're dressed, you know, representing our fire department, you know, let's talk about that vehicle sticker that identifies you as a fire. We all love that vehicle sticker. I think we think it's going to get us out of traffic tickets or whatever speeding tickets or the license plate or the blue light or green light or whatever light you have in your particular state. 
you know, that identifies you as a firefighter. So if you're driving and <laughs> this is the day and age of road rage, well, let's remember that we're reflecting the fire service and that sticker, that license plate, that light, whatever it is, identifies you, not just your own department as a member of your own department, but by extension, our great fire service as well. So there's so many reasons not to fall back on that line. I'm just a volunteer, but uh, the, it just should never be used as an excuse for subpar behavior or performance either. So great, great advice. And uh, for our listeners, I just want to remind everybody, you're listening to Fire Engineering Talk Radio and the Professional Volunteer Fire Department. And uh, the guest on this episode is Chief John Buckman, who wrote a fantastic book, What I've Learned So Far, Leading and Managing Volunteers. It's 111 pages packed full of information. Um, it's only $30, I believe, right, Chief? And you can do it through yes. Venmo or PayPal. And uh, um, the, uh, right here, you know, before we go on to a couple final things to talk about, is there any anything you want to pass on to listeners about how they can get a copy of this book? Certainly. Thanks, Tom. If, the, if you want a copy of the book, if you'll email me, uh, or text me. It'd probably be easier to text me because it'd, it'd be easier for you to remember this. My my phone number is 812-480-4339. Uh, text me with your information and I'll send you the Venmo and the um, PayPal QR code, whichever one you want to use. If you don't want to do those, you can I'll always pay by check and tell me that and I'll give you my home address so you can do that. But I uh, want to try to make the book available that, uh, again, and Tom's comment I want to thank you for the comment about it's, it should it's supposed to be an easy read sit down read three pages today read three pages tomorrow read seven pages on the next day uh, it's not one of those fiction kind of books you need to read from start to finish mm -hmm. and uh, I like Tom your comment about highlighters I'm a highlighting <laughs> fiend and it's like you know just use get some highlighters and mark it up yeah yeah definitely definitely um and I want to dive into something that certainly all volunteer organizations experience and uh, have to deal with. And we've talked a little bit about it so far, but um, motivating volunteers, inspiring volunteers, improving morale of the volunteer fire department, and I guess closely related, and you talk about all of these in the book, and another reason for our listeners to get a copy of the book, reducing organizational drama. Every organization can have drama and, and it, can, it can lead to demotivated membership and uninspired volunteers. So what, what can we do as a professional volunteer fire department and as a professional volunteer firefighter to reduce the drama, to inspire members, to, to get members coming through the door to see an energized and motivated and maybe a harmonious team? What can we do to fix some of this? Well, I think the, the, the biggest thing is that we don't remind our members that we're, we have a mission and a vision to provide service. And we don't remind them enough that this is, this is what we're supposed to be doing. Instead, we allow the members to get into these petty little gripes, these petty little differences, instead of reminding them, it's like, you, know, you, got, you guys need to take that outside and work that out by yourself. That's not a fire department issue. Our mission is this. Our vision of how we'll do it is this way. And we don't reinforce that, what our job is. We just think, oh, everybody's got it. Well, every salesman will tell you, you have to continually and continually get the message out. Repeated the same message, which gets old. And when you look at business meetings, why do we have business meetings today? Because we're a fraternal organization or a professional organization. Well, if we're fraternal, it's going to be very hard to get an organizational drama out because that's, that's part of fraternal organization. But getting, you know, it's like, do you still vote to pay the utility bill every month at the business meeting? Really? Well, what would you do if they voted no? <laughs> We're not going to pay the electric bill. So why, why do we, so I think we create drama in some of the things that we vote on. In my department, years ago and still today, we vote on the budget. We may spend two hours on the budget in January, and that's it. Unless you're going to spend more than $10,000 for one item, that budget has been approved. The fire chief is charged with going out and spending that money. And so we don't have that business meeting every month to sit there and argue about whether we're going to buy a strainer or a nozzle. Uh, so, but, but you have to learn to make, you have to, one, 
is when you see conflict happen between two or more people, you as the leader have to step in and stop it. That's when it's, it's drama in our department is like cancer. Once you've got it, unless you cut it out, it's still going to be there. And so you've got to stop that drama when you see it or hear about it. The other part is just like cancer. Sometimes you got to go in for the for surgery to cut that cancer out. Sometimes you have to make you, I have this saying, don't make me use my officer voice. You will regret it. And the point is that there are times when you're going to have to walk over to one of the members and go, let's, let's go out in the base or let's go outside. And I'm going to have a frank, frank to frank conversation. You're not helping this fire department. Your mouth is overloading your butt and I don't appreciate it. I am the fire chief. Here's my expectations of how I expect you to perform. And don't make any threats. Just leave it at that. Here's what I want you to do. And that takes a lot of guts. Um, and, I'm, I'm, and it's got to be for real stuff. It can't be for petty stuff. But we have a lot of people who live for drama. They, they love to be in drama. They mm -hmm. love to create it. They love to be the stars of it. Well, if that's the kind of person you're dealing with, you got to tell them, it may be time for you to leave. Go right. find someplace else. Yeah. Some hard advice. And uh, I mean, it's definitely, it's not always easy to do, like you said. And uh, you spend some time too. You know, that, that falls a lot of time to the chief or an officer. So I want to get your thoughts on the professional volunteer fire officer. You share a few good points in the book about what it takes to be a good officer. And then you point out, and it's so true, such as what you just talked about reducing drama, because the atmosphere a leader creates will determine whether, you know, the staff of volunteers is going to be motivated. So um, what's, what advice would you give our fire officers, whether they're brand new or whether they've been in office for a few years, how, what should they be recognizing the, of importance in their role? What, what should they be looking for? I think, I think the first thing and, and is everybody needs to learn how to smile <laughs> or relearn how to smile. Uh, we have a tough life. Everybody's life is tough. I'm not talking about politics, Democrat or Republican, but we, are, we have challenges in, in each of our lives, but walk in with a smile and keep that. And I will tell you this, just by smiling, you release endorphins into your body, which are healthy for you, which help you with that positive attitude. But if the, if the firefighters see you walking in the door with a frown on your face, they get a frown on their face. So my first advice to officers is learn to smile again. If you're not happy with the job, then quit, step down, uh, Pro, pro, not promote you, uh, step down a rank, go from a captain to a lieutenant or a battalion chief to a, to a captain. And, but be happy. If, if this job is not making, especially in the, vol, in the all volunteer system where nobody's being paid anything, if you're not happy doing it, why are you doing it? I mean, it's like, it's like a baseball umpire. Yes, if they're making so many mistakes, they get yelled at for every pitch. They're not having any fun, quit. And so it's the same thing with the captain. If you're not having fun doing this job as a leader and inspiring other people to, to come along with you, then quit, step aside, step down. That, that's the first thing, smile. And if you're not having fun, uh, step aside because people know you're not having fun and they'll, they'll see it when, they, when you walk in. Body language is so important. Reading body language is so important because you can get so many messages from people. Right. And be willing to learn about your people. <laughs> like we talked yeah. about earlier, you know, get to know your people. If you're going to be an officer in the organization, you need to understand the diverse uh, types of personalities that uh, make up your department and be willing to work with all of them and understand what makes them tick, which leads me to that younger generation. Oh, I can't work with these new people. You talked a little bit about it earlier. I love our younger people as well. They make me laugh. Uh, they pick on me. I know, you know, when I first knew I was getting to be one of the older firefighters is when I talked about riding the back step and they looked at me probably like I would have looked at somebody who possibly used to ride with horses or something. That's when I knew, you know, but um, what do you think of this new generation? Well, the, the, I, I, I'm enthusiastic about the new generation, but I will say that they don't have the patience that we have. Uh, Chief Brunacini had a picture in one or a, a 
car caricature in one of his books of a guy with all these jewelry hanging out, long hair, you know, uh, nose uh, uh, rings and all this kind of stuff, talking to the Bernstein secretary and says, yeah, I, I want to join the fire department. I, you know, I, I want to come on I, in 30 days from now. Can I be chief? <laughs> well, the young people don't want to wait. They believe that they're pretty smart and they are pretty smart, uh, but you have to have experience to be smart. And that's what they're lacking in. So somehow or other, you got to get them experience. But, but young people want to give, they want to be given responsibility and they want to be given credit when they do the right thing. And whether that, where it's a young person or an older person, everybody deserves credit from a simple thank you to a plaque to something, you know, maybe more expensive. But, you know, so people, people, the young people today, I believe if you'll ask them, they'll do it now. It may not be next week or, or two weeks from now, but they'll get around to it. If you tell them, look, I, I got six weeks to get this done. They probably won't do it till week six yeah. uh, because they got other things to do. But uh, I see that the, you know, I look around my department is a young department. Uh, our fire chief uh, just turned 40. Uh, we have two, we have a female fire chief and a female assistant chief. And uh, they all started in October and January. But the young, the officers we have are all young. They don't have a lot of experience, but the other day, one of the, the protective clothing guy put out a notice that said, uh, hey, it's summertime, watch for that ultraviolet exposure for your gear, keep your gear in your trunk, not in your back seat. And I thought, wow, Sam, where did you hear that at? He had to read something. Nobody told him to put that announcement out via text message, but that's what, that's what we want. So he, he was studying his job yeah. to be better. And I thank them. I, you know, I will, I will send them a note. I'll, I, I have to be careful when I say, call them up and say, Hey, where are you at? I want to meet. Cause then they think they're in trouble, but 99% of the time they're not in trouble, but they, they, so my point is the young people, if you give them a job, they'll do it. And they, in most cases, will take it to heart. Ronnie Coleman, former California state fire marshal told me this years ago, but when you ask somebody to do something, you 80% of the people will make you happy. 20% will not focus on that 80%. Yeah. And I, I think he's right. When I look at all the involvement things I've done, have a meeting with 10 people in it, there'll be 10 people to take an assignment. Eight of them will do it. Two of them will not Yeah. adapt. Forget those two people and move on. Don't yeah. let those two people slow the ship down. Yeah, and Chief, you wrote in a book too, and it's so true for our officers out there. Just keep in mind, and the, the Chief has a great quote here, and you'll be seeing it on my... Uh, professional Facebook page soon enough. The success of your fire department is rooted in the mindset and action of your officers, which is directly impacted by their leadership ability. So true. Don't ever underestimate the impact you are having, good or bad, as an officer. You know, Tom, it's it's amazing. I, I, again, I said earlier, I'm lucky, and I'm sure you get this as well. It's, I, you'll go somewhere. Well, we had the tornadoes in Kentucky um, that came through and ripped the towns apart. And President Biden was coming down. And I thought, I'm going to go down and go to the fire department, see if they can't get me in, you know, close so I get some pictures of the president there. And I walked in. Uh, I was dressed nice, so I casual, uh, had my camera on. And I walked, I said, is the chief here? And he said, yep, chief's here. And so I walked up to him, shook his hand and told him who I was, what I was wanting. And there's two guys at the table going, we know who you are. Like, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, we've, we've been in classes with you. Like, oh, great. Because I, I do a lot of teaching in Kentucky as well. And so when you, when you look at the influence that you have, you have no idea what influence you have when you talk to somebody today or do something around somebody today and they remember what you told them. And it comes up, whatever, 10, 15 years later. So everybody influences other people negatively or positively and your behavior is what will influence them negatively i'm probably going to tell a bad story on myself and it pains me to admit this but i embarrassed myself in front of my granddaughter eight years old the other day because i lost my temper not at her not that wasn't it any of it but but she witnessed it and i think to myself oh john Oh, you you got you got to repay that some way. I'm gonna have to rebuild that, and because I see the look in her face, and of like, Grandpa, 
what, what, what are you so mad about? And that, that hurts me to say, but I'm also saying, look, we're all, nobody's perfect. So you apologize to them and you don't do it again. And so when you look at influencing people, when you make a mistake, own it. My dad mm-hmm. told me that a long time ago. Don't try to blame somebody else. You made it, own it, and then move ahead. So that's, um, I'm not sure Kate will listen to this podcast, but uh, <laughs> you know, it's, um, it, it's important to me to, to admit to people, hey, I make mistakes too. Yeah, we're human. And I, I, can, I can see it in her eyes. And I, can, I can see the look in her eyes of, I'll say fear and thinking, oh, you, 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 you can recover, but you're going to have to repay this. And, um, and I don't mean money, but, you know, you have to repay it in actions and never do it again. I mean, that, you know. Yeah, um, you're, you're human. And, and part of being a good leader is to be humble and recognize, look in the mirror every now and then and give yourself a good size up and recognize when we make mistakes, but then understanding what we can do to maybe correct or overcome or improve the next time. So there's nothing wrong with that. I give you credit for, for telling that story because we've all been there for sure. Um, I, I really want to thank you for spending some time with me today. And as we end the show, I, I particularly like the page you had toward the end. Uh, devoted to professional development. I think you titled it professional development for the leader in the department staff with volunteers. And you know, it, it kind of reminds me of the presentation I'm doing next week for the New York State Chiefs. I call it professional development for the volunteer firefighter. But you believe it's important for all firefighters to undergo a series of you know, steps to improve as a professional, professional development to become better, whether you're an officer, whether you're a firefighter, and you've got recommended reading, uh, for the uh, for the firefighter that wants to improve, you've got recommended organizations that say they should belong to. And um, would you agree with me that it, it's still important in 2022 for people to read, for people to join these organizations, and for people to get out of their own bubble and get out and network at the shows? It's not all available online. Would you agree with that? Oh, I, I do agree with that. I think... Uh... I do a lot of audible books. So I do a lot of driving. I do a lot of listening, uh, but I do still like paper books. And, uh, but the professional development never stops. And even in the list of the books, the list, list of stuff that I have, it's not all fire service stuff. There are a lot of great books out there that can inspire you that are not written by firefighters or in, in even the fire service. Uh, but so I think that that is important that we continue to learn and you, you, networking is so important. Again, I, I, I was so lucky that people let me in the door. Right. I collected cards, business cards from everybody. And, you know, so, so yes, you got to get out there. You got to get out of your bubble and see what they're doing out there in the other world. Because German Township would not be the department we are today if it wasn't for the 60s when they got out, outside their department in 62 and went to Indianapolis and saw three volunteer fire departments up there and said, that's the model we want to use. Mm-hmm. And so they did that. And so uh, we'll, uh, you know, so that, that's important. Then as you look at, you know, who your relationships with today is when you see a fire chief having a problem somewhere, call them up and talk to them. Ask them, what did they learn from How did they fix it? So on and so forth. Uh, that, that knowing other people outside of your bubble is so important to helping you because when you have a problem, they can help you as well. You know, I, I tell you, get, and I'll be glad to help you if you want. Get, you know, I gave you my phone number, you can give it to you, or, you know, you can have it again. But I listen to more fire chiefs calling me up and going, You're not going to believe what my idiot firefighters did today. And I, I just listen and I'll give them my opinion. Sometimes they take it, sometimes they don't. But you need that person, you need to be able to vent that. And the only way you get that is get outside your, your world because you're, you're not going to tell your neighboring fire chief what a stupid thing your firefighter did because it'll get back. But, you know, I could be 300 miles away and I tell stories when I do presentations. I go, you're never going to get to Evansville, so I'm not worried about me. You get me in trouble with this statement. But we have had, we all have them because you said it, people are human and they, you know, they, they're going to they're going to make mistakes. But you, you got to have somebody that will mentor you, will listen to you. Uh, it's not your wife. You do not want to take these kind of problems home. They're your spouse, I should say. Because we do have females that, that are chief officers. So, you know, just so, so look at how you can build that 
mentor that you can call up and go, hey, I just need to vent and just sit there and listen to them. And if they ask your opinion, give you give them your opinion. Right. Right. It, you just got to get out of your bubble. Listeners, please understand. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to the big conferences because, of the, you know, obviously FDIC and fire officers can be expensive. I get that. But when a local seminar is coming to your area, uh, try and attend. When, uh, get involved in your local organizations, okay. chief organizations, firefighter associations, and get out there and network because the, the payback will be double what you put into it. And, and then the bottom line, too, is not just the advice you're going to get and the help maybe with issues and problems, the friendships that you are going to make. And friendships put smiles on your face. And smiles on your face, as the chief said, can double and triple through your organizations, improve morale, improve your own mental health, and, and the payback is worth it. So get out of your own bubble. Chief, at the, at the very end of the book, you have some final tips. Don't forget to relax and recharge sometimes too. I, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but do you have any final tips um, to share with our listeners? I think on page 101 in, in the book, and I thought that would be a good place to, to end our conversation um, and any other final words of wisdom. Um, and again, for the listeners, uh, we're going to give the chief a chance to, to talk one more time about how to get this book. Uh, please, please consider it. Um, it. It'll help you whether you're an officer, whether you're a firefighter, um, whether you're a support member in your department, it need not matter. And that book, again, what I've learned so far, Leading and Managing Volunteers by Chief John Buckman III. Final tips, Chief. Well, uh, if they're interested in the book, they can uh, text me at 812-480-4339 or call me. That's my phone number. Uh, but the final tips, and I was not good at this. I, I was a workaholic. I'd work 10, 12, 14 hours a day five, six, seven days a week. That's what I was. Take time for yourself. Decompress. Uh, you know, two, start out with one hour a week, two hours a week in which I'm going to do, I'm going to go do whatever I want to do, whether it's play golf, go have a beer, go, go to the pool hall, you know, go to the club, you know, whatever it is, take at least one hour a week for yourself. I, and it, it, because one, it will make you healthier. And you know what? Chief Steve Cox of South Bend, Indiana told me this years ago. He was told this by a previous fire chief. No matter how late you stay in the office, there will still be work to do tomorrow. So if you don't take time for yourself, you're just going to keep working and working and working and working. And that's not healthy. So take time for yourself. Sometimes I need to become the most important thing in my life and take care of it. It could be going work out. I mean, I, I do not want to miss a morning at Bob's gym. I want to go work out every morning and ride my bike and, and you'll know, do the stretching exercises. And that's, that's important to me. And you can't just do that once a week. And so it's the same thing here with, you know, taking time for yourself is take time for yourself to make sure that you will lead a long, healthy, and prosperous life. No, oh, fantastic advice. Awesome. And, and, and you're so right. I've been trying to follow that. It's not always easy because it's easy to get bogged down doing with all, you know, your to-do list. And um, I've been running quite a bit and I've been trying to get myself before I do anything else to go for a nice three mile run to start my day off. So and again, it's not always easy. Today it was pouring rain out, so I couldn't do it. So, <laughs> but um I want to really thank you for, for spending, for first of all, writing the book. Um, um, I enjoyed it very much and I still enjoy it. It's still sitting uh, by my favorite lounger on my nice screened in patio outside and with the nice weather by my pool. Uh, and I'm reading it, rereading it, highlighting. And uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to, to be on the show here today where we, again, for the listeners, we covered just very, very little bit of, of what this book has to offer you. So I highly recommend it. Everything about building your own morale, building your department morale, reducing drama, reducing burnout, uh, advice for a new chief officer, leading the younger generation. You give your thoughts on mutual aid, um, talking about how to enact change, uh, a big 
part of your program and what you like to talk about is, and, and it applies so directly to the professional volunteer fire department is don't be afraid of change. And as a matter of fact, change is the only way we're going to survive. So um, lots, lots of good material. And, and on my professional volunteer fire department page, I have a section devoted to recommended reading and this book will be added to that very shortly. Um, I'm still learning the ins and outs of posting to my uh um, faith, not Facebook, but uh, my website. So I'll figure it out and I'll have the book on there as well, because it's definitely my going to make my recommended reading list. So chief, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very thank much. You. Much, You're much welcome. appreciate And you know, I, did it. <clears throat> um, I, I, I appreciate it. I really do. I know trying to find the time can sometimes be hard, but we made it work. And uh, uh, one last time for your contact info chief, in case people now found a pen to write it down. My phone number, 812-480-4339. You can text me at that number as well. If you're not into texting, but you want to send an email, jmbuckman3rd at gmail.com uh, will get to me as well. So thanks for that, Tom. Is that the number three or Roman numeral three? It is the number three. Okay, very good. jmbuckman3, number three, rd. Okay, very good. Very good. Well, thanks again. And as we finish up here, uh, the chief had very early in his book, and I thought it would be appropriate for ending the show tonight. The public does not care what color your truck is, what fire department you are from, and the public doesn't care whether you are paid or volunteer. The public does care that you respond quickly, you help solve their problem, and you are nice while you are helping them out. That my friends, is a professional volunteer firefighter representing a professional volunteer fire department. So thank you again for listening in. My contact information, anybody wanting to reach out to me, please do so. I'm constantly getting great emails from the brothers and sisters out there. tamerrill63 at aol.com. You can check out my professional volunteer Facebook page, my Twitter, my Instagram. I'm always posting inspirational quotes from books and things that I've read. There'll be many coming from this book, I can tell you that. As I just mentioned, my Professional Volunteer Fire Department website is live, uh, theprofessionalvfd.com. And you can also type the whole thing out, the Professional Volunteer Fire Department.com. Please check it out. I have links to all my articles, my podcasts, where I'm going to be doing presentations and things that I offer, list of my presentations and recommended reading. And again, thanks to Fire Engineering, my fire engineering family who means so much to me, Chief Bobby Halton and all the others who support these podcasts, not just mine, but all the other great podcasts by great people in our fire service. I'm honored to be among them. I'm honored that you choose to listen in to my show. So thanks for joining me here tonight, live or if you pre-recorded it to listen to later. I just want you to know I truly appreciate it. My next show is scheduled for Tuesday, July 26th, and I'll be back with you tackling some more important topics that involve our great volunteer fire service. So thank you for listening in. Stay safe. And please remember, folks, true professionalism is not defined by a paycheck. And your residents are owed professional service delivered by professional firefighters representing a professional organization. It's that simple. Thank you very much.